Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I just had a really great chat with Professor Eddie Coyle from the University of Texas in Austin. He and I go back a long way. When I was doing my PhD with Mark Hargraves way back in the 90s, um, I, did, I did carbohydrate ingestion stuff, I did fluid ingestion stuff, and, and Eddie and I were both sort of doing similar areas. Um, he's doing really interesting stuff now. So we talk about his idea about inactivity and exercise resistance, which, which is something that was a bit new to me here. So the idea that if you don't do enough steps during the day, if you exercise later in the day, you won't have the beneficial effects on your metabolism the next day. So you need to be, you know, not just sitting around. So we already know about that, but he's got a different sort of edge to that. And then we talked about his really interesting work with four second repeated sprints. So, you know, we're all familiar with HIIT training, but we tend to think there of sort of 20 second, 30 second sprints where you get lactate through the roof. It's really hard work. Uh, it takes a while to recover between each, each bout of exercise. So it takes a bit longer. Now here he's talking about doing four seconds all out and just having short recoveries. So you can have the whole session over in like 10 to 20 minutes. And what you get here is not just improvements in VO2 max, so your aerobic capacity, but you also get improvements in your anaerobic power, you get in, uh, increases in strength and some metabolic benefits. So I think you'll really enjoy this one. So stick around. Hi, Eddie. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine, Glenn. How are you doing? Oh, I'm great. Wow. I'm just really happy to see you, man, to be honest. You've, you've had a big influence on me during my PhD with your carbohydrate ingestion stuff, your fluid stuff. And it's great to see you. Oh, well, you too. And thanks for having me as a guest. Absolutely. I, re I reckon you're a legend. <laughs> <laughs> Not that old yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, did, I didn't put it in the Twitter. I said, I've, we got the legend Claude Bouchard coming up. We've got the legend Jerry Dempsey coming up. And I, I can't overuse the legend word, but I can say it now. I reckon you're a legend. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you're still going strong. How old are you now? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, I, I just turned 70 last week. So wow. I've been here, here at Texas for 40 years. Wow. Yeah, any, any, plan, any plans? You're still going? <laughs> well, I'm planning on retiring in about two years. You know, I'm, I'm looking to finish up two doctoral students now. Okay. And, uh, you know, then after that, you know, we've been having fun with this uh, inertial load, er, load ergometer that we've developed for four second sprints. And I want to try and popularize that a bit more because it's a very uh, effective way to train in, in just 10 minutes a day. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So we, we're going to get into that. I really want to. Yeah. So what we're going to talk about is, uh, you know, your your concept. To be honest, I hadn't really heard about this of, um, you know, inactivity and exercise resistance. So that's really interesting. And then, you know, feed into your four second sprints, which is amazing. So why don't you just explain this, this idea of um, exercise resistance? What are, what are you thinking about there? Well, what we're thinking about is inactivity. And, uh, you know, if a person is just too inactive, taking too few steps, when they go out to exercise, the exercise may not be uh, fully effective in promoting healthy adaptations. In other words, we, we've seen that when uh, people are taking less than 8,500 steps a day. And then in the, in the evening of that day, they run for one hour. They don't show improvements in their lip, lipid metabolism. Um, the, you know, normally when somebody runs for one hour, the, the next morning, they'll have a lower plasma triglyceride level. And if you give them a high fat meal, they'll be able to clear the triglyceride, take it out of the bloodstream at, at a higher rate. Uh, but that doesn't happen if you've, if you've been uh, inactive, you know, taking too few steps or whatever uh, on the day before. So, what, you know, what, we've, what, what we believe, and this is something that was pioneered by Frank Booth and, and Mark Hamilton, is that uh, inactivity is, is not just the lack of exercise, yeah. of, of not doing good. That inactivity does things uh, that are bad, that uh, can override even the beneficial effects of, of exercise. Mm. So, you know, 
you know, it's been well known that people who are uh, very inactive during the day, even if they meet the, the uh, requirements, the physical activity requirements uh, for, for exercise of 30 to 60 minutes a day, uh, that if they're inactive, but, but, uh, but exercising, that they still have a higher risk of heart disease and, and death. You know, if, if, you know, if you sit all day long and take, you know, a few steps, less than 5,000 steps, for example, uh, uh, but you do exercise, uh, you, you'll still be at risk for, for heart disease and death. Yeah, so this, this is pretty interesting. So I mean, it's very interesting. So this is like an extension. Well, it's, it's a progression from the idea that, you know, like all this research that people have looked at was sitting time, for example. So, you, you know, they say if you exercise, I always thought because I would like ride my bike to work. But then like if you sit all day and then you ride your bike home, I'm like, hang on a minute. You know, I've done like two rides. Are you telling me that like sitting for eight hours is going to mess you up? And that's, that's the idea. You're, sort of, you're going there and taking it a bit even further. If, if you're doing the exercise cycling in the morning, uh, it's possible that you, you can uh, override the effects of, of, of uh, sitting too long. So we're doing studies now looking at the timing of when you do your activity okay. and you know the question is when you're inactive uh, how long does it take before you, you uh you know develop the the uh, negative health consequences of it it's a matter of hours at least regarding fat metabolism uh, so, so you know, this is a totally new area, and we don't, we really don't know anything about the the amount of inactivity and the timing of the inactivity relative to when you normally do your your exercise training. Actually, I might just step back, make sure people are getting it uh, fully. So, the main point you're saying there is, an, is something you don't necessarily think about is that when you exercise. Then the next day you're saying you you burn more you have a higher fat oxidation so you're burning more fat which obviously people want and you're clearing your triglycerides right so which is a, like a basically a, a byproduct of fat well actually why don't you explain triglycerides because that's also up with carbohydrate ingestion yes um you know with with triglyceride uh we essentially do a high fat tolerance test analogous to a, a glucose tolerance test mm -hmm. where people have ice cream for breakfast. So in the morning, they have so many grams of fat in the ice cream. And then, you know, that raises their plasma triglycerides, which, which are cleared over the course of six hours. So if, if, you've, if you've been inactive, mm -hmm. you, you're, the triglycerides go much higher in the bloodstream than if you've been active, taking 8,000 steps per day the, 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 the day before. If they've been active the day before, they're able to, to uh, take more triglyceride out of the bloodstream. And we think it's going into muscle. We haven't really measured that yet. They're able to take more triglyceride out of the bloodstream and lower the plasma triglyceride levels, which is a healthy response. Uh, we all... You know, we, we think that the factor regulating the, the, the clearance of triglycerides from the bloodstream is the enzyme lipoprotein lipase. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a biochemical effect that, that you gain from your last bout of exercise. But it's also a, a, a biochemical effect that can be uh, negated that you can have a negative response if you've been too inactive the day before. Yeah, right. So this is interesting. I was trying to think about it. So when you do like a, so you actually do a pretty serious, like a one hour run uh, on the evening, and then you look the next day at with your, your triglyceride clearance and your fat oxidation. So just to clarify, so fat oxidation is burning fat. Yeah, so you're burning it up. 
and then um, taking up the triglycerides. So it's interesting because if you've exercised, if you've done a run the day before, you'd obviously be having muscle glycogen synthesis the next morning. But you're saying you're you're synthesizing glycogen, but at the same time, you're taking up fat potentially. Well, I guess the milieu, the, the, the hormonal milieu changes such that if you've had a fat meal, you're probably not going to have much insulin. So you won't be probably doing a whole lot of glycogen resynthesis at that point, I guess. So maybe you're switching from synthesizing glycogen to sort of taking up fat. Is that maybe what's going on? Well, you know, after the one hour run, which is done in the evening, you know, we give them a standardized meal that has about 200 grams of carbohydrate. Oh. So, you know, we, I expect that that'll be not a huge amount, but enough to uh, resynthesize some glycogen. Absolutely. One thing we haven't seen is, is an effect on the plasma glucose responses. When you eat ice cream, it has, of course, the, the fat, and the but sugar. it also has sugar, mm -hmm. the glucose. Yeah. And, uh, and so glucose levels go up during that six hour period and insulin levels go up also. Um, but we haven't seen much effect of the inactivity uh, on the uh, glucose tolerance or insulin sensitivity. But we, we haven't done those studies directly where we give the glucose without the ice cream, just, yeah. just a, a standard glucose tolerance test, yes. a, sta a standard ins insulin sensitivity test. Um, so, so those are studies that need to be done. Yeah, there's a lot of questions there. Now, the other thing I said is, you know, my thing about riding to work and then sitting all day. Well, I actually didn't do that because I've got a bad back. So um, I'd ride to work and then I'd have a standing desk all day and then I'd ride home. Now, I was interested in your paper. I noticed that you said the standing and the sitting, you, you mentioned somewhere in there that it was no, it's not really any different. So standing all day doesn't really, you know, cut it even. You've got to be moving around. Yes. Wow. So basically, you know, we had people stand for 12 hours or sit for 12 hours. And, and we measured their, both their glucose tolerance and their fat tolerance with the test I just described. And it made the standing uh, had no benefit. It was, it was the same as sitting as far as the, the metabolic responses. Um, it had a slight effect on raising resting metabolic rate the next morning, very small effect. Okay. But, but that was it. So I think that the prime reason you should stand is either allows you to stay awake better or uh, you have back issues that, <laughs> you know, that are aggravated by sitting. Exactly. All right. So that's interesting. So, so the thing sitting around all day, what occurred to me when I was reading your paper was I thought, hang on a minute, cyclists, cyclists, you know, serious Tour de France cyclists, they will ride their bikes and then they were like laying in a couch and they're like, oh, this is what I heard anyway, you probably know more. They, they're, they're scared to actually use their legs at all. They just rest all day. <laughs> what do you think is going on with them? I don't know. That's a good question. And I, I've had the same question. You know, yeah. and, you know I kind of wonder, you know, when, when you're putting in that many hours. Uh -huh. uh, with no you know, no loading it, as well. So their bones are wasting away as well. Totally different. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't really apply. It's not it's not like the one hour runs that we've been doing. Exactly. Exactly. Um, another thing it's made me think about is um, you know we're talking about this inactivity sort of physiology yeah? that if you don't do enough steps you don't get the same improvements. I guess I start thinking about things like VO two max straight away. I don't know if it really fits, but you know we always say that the people that are the most inactive are going to get the biggest increases in VO2 max with training, for example. Right. So then I start thinking about, hang on, we're talking about exercise resistance if you're inactive. How does that fit? Because you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we did a, a training study and it was short term, uh, only a, a little over two weeks of, of intense training. And uh, one group uh, was taking about 10,000 steps a day 
the other group was taking 4,000 steps a day. And the, uh, the VO2 max went up equally in the two groups. So inactivity or lower activity, you know, doesn't seem to affect VO2 max and, and maybe some of the, some other cardiovascular adaptations to training. But the metabolic responses were blunted in the group that was too inactive. They had uh, higher blood lactates during exercise. They had uh, lower fat oxidation during exercise. Um, so, you know, it may be that the, uh, you know, the inactivity affects metabolism more than the classic cardiovascular. And that study was published in Med Science, Sports and Exercise uh, with Burton as the first author in, in 2021. Okay, well, I guess that kind of makes sense, right? Because because I guess we're talking about the difference between inactivity and fitness. So we tend to say, and this probably fits with what Ben Levine was saying as well. He was saying like walking isn't enough to sort of affect your cardiac structure and things like that. So, you know, you're not going to think, okay, if I walk, I'm going to get an increase in VO2 max. You're more going to get an increase in your sort of metabolic health. Is that, is that fair to say? And then you need higher intensity to get enough stress on the heart to increase your left ventricle volume and increase your VO, you know, your cardiac output and your VO2 max and things. Is that, is that a fair summation? That makes sense to me. It agrees with what we've observed. Effects of walking are mainly to get steps in so you don't, you can't be classified as being inactive or you don't st start turning on all those uh, unhealthy stimuli. So, uh, you know, when, when I'm asked to recommend activities, you know, I, now I take two different approaches. One, I say, you need to make sure that you are walking enough so you don't turn on the unhealthy stuff from inactivity. Yep. And then two, you have the recommendation, you know, of, of the exercise to uh, promote some more metabolic adaptations and but mostly stimulate the the cardiovascular system and raise VO2 max. Yeah, so to kind of sum that up, so you do your walking, you, you, you're physically active during the day, yeah, and that's going to help your metabolic health and help your risk of heart disease and things in that way. But then if you do, you know, exercise, where you actually, you know, get your breathing up and you might sweat a bit and whatever, that's going to help your cardiovascular fitness, which will also help your heart disease risk and things but sort of they're related but they're they're different is that fair to say right yeah and the exercise <clears throat> the exercise has to be somewhat intense in order to bring about that cardiovascular improvement yeah and the other funny thing i thought of is is when i was reading a paper was you know you're talking about the recommendations for for exercise the who recommendations or whatever so they're saying this many minutes of moderate or this many minutes of intense in this many minutes of weight training or whatever, but there's actually no talk about anything below moderate, yeah. But I guess it, I guess it depends how unfit you are because someone walking, if they're really unfit, that is going to be moderate intensity exercise, right? Yeah, walking would be would be moderate. Walking at three and a half, four miles an hour. Yep. All right. So that's there's a lot of you know there's a bit of this is the trouble with, with uh, quite often I say with people is. Um, you know, it's, it's easy. Just do some exercise and eat healthy and that's it. But then but then you actually realize there is a bit of nuance in there, you know. So we want to make it simple so people do it and not do, oh, this is too hard. You know, I, I don't get it. Am I meant to be walking or, you know, what are you saying, Eddie? Should I be walking or running or cycling? Or what are you, you know, it's too complicated. How many minutes? The main thing we want them is to just do something, right? But, to yeah. move, yeah. Move. You know, the, big, the biggest problem, of course, is in people who do nothing, taking less than 2,000 steps a day. And of course, they had the, the highest incidence of heart disease and death. Yeah. Now, if they just do a little bit of exercise, um, 
you know, even walking, that'll be, that'll be very beneficial for them. They may reduce their chance of heart disease from, from 1.0 down to 0.8. So 20% reduction. So, you know, getting, getting moving is so important. And, and, you know, I'm wondering and thinking that the benefit of getting, just getting moving that initial, going from 2000 steps a day to maybe 6,000 steps a day is uh, because you're, you're uh, preventing the harmful effects of inactivity. So nothing to do with nothing to do with exercise. So you do. I don't want to put you on the spot here. I don't know the answer. But are you practicing what you preach, Eddie? Are you doing the? Are you getting out there or what? <laughs> well, here in Texas, if I want to get out, I better do it in the morning. <laughs> yeah. So I do go out and and, and get my uh, eight thousand five hundred steps <laughs> in the morning, and and then do a. Uh, do a cycling workout sometime later during the day. Perfect. So um, this is probably an obvious answer that cycling will do the trick as well. But your study, you looked at running in the evening, which I was actually surprised with, actually, because, you know, you get your average Joe, they're going to be able to cycle for an hour. But just running for an hour is pretty hard, yeah? But I'm assuming you get the same if you cycle for an hour in the evening, yeah? I, I think so. You know, we wanted to make it, um, a bit more practical to what more people do. And I think more people run than, than, than cycle. It's also uh, hard. <laughs> yeah. And we did a couple of pilot studies to see if we get the same response with, uh, with cycling. And, and we did. There you so. go. This is why this man's a legend, right? Anything I throw at him, he's already thought of it. He's already done it. It's already <laughs> on the, you know, it's in the ethics committee or something. So does it make a difference how long you think you've been in it? I, I can't expect you to have said, oh, yeah, we've looked at that as well. If you've been, again, another thing with Ben Levine, you know, it's like oh, if, you've, if you haven't started exercise until like 50, later than 55, it looks like you may have already, yeah, you know, it might be a bit late for the heart or whatever. Like, do, does it make a difference how long you think you've been inactive or how old you are when you start doing these things? Or do you think it's likely to apply to everyone pretty much? I, I don't know. I've only done one study with with aging, at least one study here at Texas. And we we uh, we might talk about it when we talk about the four second sprint, but we had a group of 50 to 70 year olds trained for eight weeks doing repeated four second sprints. And we compared them to a group that was 23 years old. And they, they both showed the same adaptations. Okay. So there was, you know, at least at least to, you know, the four second repeated sprint sprints. We did, didn't see that the older individuals, you know, fail to adapt in a in a healthy way. And oh, we okay. even measured their leg volumes to see if they were getting bigger and, and they were significantly increasing their, their, their thigh volumes. Okay, so as you said, before we um, actually started recording, you said, you know, the inactivity physiology and the four second sprint stuff obviously interacts because that's one way you can actually do your activity. So you can do like an, an hour run in the evening and then look at the, the measurements the next day, or you could do these short, so very short sprints. So tell me what you've been doing there and, and how you actually got down to like four seconds because it kind of, you go, okay, 30 second sprint, that's going to be hard. And then 10 seconds. Tell me about your four second sprints. Well, we, you know, we all know in the last 20 years, the, the interest in high intensity interval training. And, you know, I'm a proponent of that. And, you know, especially the work that, that Marty Gabala has been doing. Uh, and, but typically it advocates going for 20 to 30 seconds all out while cycling on a stationary ergometer. Well, that is hard. <laughs> I think everybody's going to agree that you build up a huge amount of lactic acid. You know, it's, it's, a, it's been termed a Wingate test. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we took the approach that can you do interval training 
producing very high powers without experiencing all that fatigue due to lactic acid buildup. Yeah. And so the question became, well, how short can you go? And our thinking is that, that if you don't want to turn on lactic acid production from, from glycogenolysis, you can be using energy from your stored chemical stores, ATP and phosphocreatine. Yes. And you know, we all learn that you use that up in about four to six seconds, somewhere in there. So uh, we said, let's, you know, let's try doing repeated sprints. But we also want to elevate. So, so the four second sprints going as hard as you can will, will, will uh, train you for power, for you know, muscle strength and muscle power. We also want to add a, a uh, cardiovascular component. So we, we had people rest only 15 seconds between each all out sprint, or we had them rest for 30 seconds, or we had them rest for 45 seconds. Uh, each of those, you know, caused heart rate to go up from, from 150 to 160 to 170 depending upon the shorter rest periods. So we felt we had, a, we had a pretty good cardiovascular stimulus along with an effective uh, maximal power anaerobic uh, muscle hypertrophy neuromuscular adaptation in the all out four seconds. And so we published a paper on that and that's uh, Bar Darley in uh, 2020. Now, I think that's a, I just want to unpack some of that stuff for some people. So, you know, sometimes when you're teaching exercise physiology, students think, oh, this is, you're either doing aerobic or anaerobic. And you know, I'm always saying, well, it's, it's usually a bit of both, you know, no matter what you're doing, but obviously there's a balance. So if you're going flat out, absolute sprint, it's mainly anaerobic. If you're going really slowly, it's mainly aerobic. So what Eddie's got onto here is that, you know, if you go flat out for 30 seconds, I think we all know your legs are burning. There's lots going on, but lactic acid's through the roof. You know, you, you're not going to be able to do that again 15 seconds later. You're wrecked, right? And that's partly, as he said, lactates through the roof. And, you know, you're kind of wrecked. But if you do it shorter, you have less lactate and you're able to use these pathways like creating phosphate more which can then resynthesize and you don't have the lactate. So you do your sprint, short recovery, you can go again, short recovery, you can go again. You don't get the lactate, you're doing massive power. So you're actually getting strength, power, and you're getting aerobic because you can't obviously exercise. You're getting aerobic during the recovery as well, right? So, you know, when you look across the board, you said it was something like 52% to 65% of VO2 max or something for the, you know, the entire bout, depending on the recovery. So you're getting the anaerobic and the aerobic, you're getting both and even some strength. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Good. Yeah. You explained <laughs> it well. Thank you. I just want to make sure everyone's on board here with the, the metabolism. So, so getting back to the students, you can be yeah. having aerobic and anaerobic. So indeed, even at, a at the end of a 30 second sprint, you're almost up at your VO2 max, right? So there's this, it's, it's all going on and you've got a situation here that they can do it over and over. So you actually do 30 four second sprints, correct? Yes, if, if you're taking only 15 seconds rest, you can do 30 sprints in a 10 minute, a little less than a 10 minute period. If you're taking, you know, uh, uh, 30 seconds rest, you're, you're able to do 18 sprints. So in our training studies, we start the people out with giving them a 45 second recovery period and then reducing that progressively down to 30 and 15 seconds. So that's the way we have progressive, progressive training. 
Okay. So then, sorry, just to clarify, so they don't they didn't all do 30 sprints with different recoveries. You, you changed the recovery length and the number of sprints, is that right? Yes. Okay. So when you start then, off, you do so just if someone was gonna, you know, you say don't try this at home, but if they are gonna try this at home, you'd start off with what? And then how would you progress? Well, in, in the uh, the older adults, we start off with 45 seconds rest, but uh, and then progress to 30 seconds rest. But in the in the younger subjects, we start out at 30 seconds rest and progress down to 15 seconds. Okay. And how many sprints at the start? Well, if you're doing if you're doing uh, 45 seconds rest, you're, you're taking about 18 sprints. Okay. So, so the longest period you, you, you had there was like, what, 20 minutes? So in your paper looking at it, you went 20 minutes was the total time. Oh, you, you did a five minute warm up, just a lower intensity. And then it was like 20, 19 and a half minutes or something was the longest. And then you got it down to like nine and a half minutes. Is that right? Right. Yes, yeah, so that's very efficient. Yeah. So the, the workouts we're doing now are, they're all 10 minutes long. Wow. And then, and then you're saying here that they're getting similar. So this is always like the, the, the question is, is people are generally like Marty Kabbalah, you're comparing the continuous exercise to the, to the, the hit or, or in this situation, you'd call this sit, right? So hit is high right. intensity interval training. This is sprint interval training, but the comparison is, then you say, okay, what happens to VO to max? What happens to metabolic health, et cetera? So, so what do you find there with those responses? Yeah, we've done two training studies, you know, both in, in the young adults and the, the older adults. And they improved about the same amount as you, you typically see in the continuous training, you know, or with the, uh, the Wingate type training, 30 second training. Uh, you know, their VO2 max went up between 10 and 15%, their, uh, you know, their blood lactate levels during steady state exercise were reduced. And, uh, you know, they, they improve their metabolism. And as I mentioned in the older adults, they, uh, you know, they put on muscle, they increase their, their uh, thigh volume. And, you know, that's, the, the group that I think needs this training the most are older adults because, you know, they're, they're losing muscle, you know, and they're losing cardiovascular fitness and, you know, they, uh, they're probably not candidates for doing, you know, more intense, when I say intense, more fatiguing uh, exercise. And they usually don't want to spend a whole lot of time. So in 10 minutes, they, they can show some significant improvements. All right. So you're getting more bang for your buck. Yeah. But are people, the question is obviously, are people going to want to do that? Are people going to want to do a max? Because so you're doing a maximum all out four second sprint over and over. Are people going to actually want to do that? And, they, and do you find people continue to do it after you finish your studies, I guess? Yeah, you know, we weren't sure, and we, especially when we started with older adults, especially, you know, some, some of the adults who had never done exercise training in their lives, some of the women, you know, how we could motivate them to go all out for four seconds. And it, it took a little bit of instruction and coaching, but they did it. And, and you know, we did a, a survey on them to, to see you know, if they liked it, if they would recommend it to a friend, if they would continue on their own. And it was over, overwhelmingly positive in their, their wanting to continue. So the whole idea that, that, you know, you have to be an athlete to go for four seconds all out, you know, that's just not true. Wow. I guess they're getting neuromuscular. You know, you, you're saying, you know, you're getting... Uh, aerobic benefits you're getting anaerobic benefits so your ability to produce power 
and you're getting strength. But I guess you'd get even I just thinking about, you know, they would there'd be a lot of learning going on there, right? A lot of neuromuscular sort of I think, you know. Yeah, I'm really interested in what it's doing to the neuro system, you know, because when you're recruiting a lot of muscle mass, you're uh, you have to be stimulating your motor cortex to a very high degree and all those neurons. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, I would think that would be a great stimulus for neurogenesis, you know, and, uh, you know, you know, and maybe preventing some of the the motor problems that, that occur with, with aging. So the, you know, the, the oldest subjects we measured their tasks of daily living, things like walking, how many times they can get out of a chair, uh, walking up a ramp, and they all improved significantly. And all the subjects said that they were better in their daily tasks having, having been through this. Um, that's awesome. That's, that's really awesome. So if, if you're saying we can get people to do that, and um, well, I'm going to try it myself. So you've motivated me there. So I, I've never tried that short. So, well, this you know when you know we look at it this way: the the power that you're generating in in a maximal four second sprint is so much higher than what you generate while while walking, running, or even exercising at VO two max. Oh, yeah. So, you know, walking, you're using about 50 watts at most. When you're exercising at 60% of VO2 max, you're using 120 watts. When you're exercising at VO2 max, a young person will be generating maybe 200 watts. But they're generating five, they're generating 1,000 watts over the four seconds. Yeah. That's five, that's five times the power output. Yeah. that you generate or 20 times the power output of walking in just the four seconds. And it may be that you don't, it's not just a matter of how long the power is high, the duration, but getting the power to be very high for a very short period. I think you know, one of the main points is that with aging, you, you're losing muscle you have this phenomena called sarcopenia and you're losing mostly your fast twitch muscle fibers and we never really get a chance to use those as we get older because you know we don't do very forceful very fast activities uh and if we try to run all out you know <laughs> i know i would pull some muscles i've tried and it's like don't do that yeah. uh so you have to find something safe that you can go, that you can go all out. And, you know, cycling is the safest thing to do because there's no eccentric lengthening. Um, I guess, I guess indoor cycling, I think in Texas, you're doing sprints around the roads of Texas. It's probably not particularly safe either. Right? So indoor cycling. <laughs> I remember you've done work with Lance Armstrong. I remember he, he was saying, uh, you know, you don't argue on a on a eight kilogram bike or whatever it is. You don't argue, argue with a one ton car. It, he's, from Plano, <laughs> he's from Plano, Texas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. So indoor cycling. So if we think about mechanisms a bit, um, so I know you've looked at red blood cell volume and red blood cell mass. So these are what's you know involved with carrying oxygen. So what sort of mechanistic stuff do you think is going on there? Yeah, I forgot, I forgot about the blood volume. Thank you for reminding me. Huh. Uh, well, you know, with, with the four second sprints, um, you know, I think it's a very potent neuromuscular workout. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's not surprising that, you know, that maximal power and thigh volume is increasing. The, uh, you know, the fact that VO2 max can go up, you know, uh, 15% mm -hmm. uh, with, with that training, you know, I think says that, you know, if you, and the training remember is only 10 minutes long. 
and you're only training for one or two minutes. And so it, it's showing you how time efficient the training, the training is in, in its stimulus. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so, you know, when you're sprinting like that, you're contracting a lot of muscle and you're, you know, you're probably el eliciting a very high a muscle pump of pumping blood back to the heart. Which, which, you know, may be uh, stretching the left ventricle enough for you to increase your stroke volume in VO2 max. Yeah. Uh, another factor uh, that we were, we were surprised to see is that the, the uh, four second training also increased blood volume. Mm -hmm. And an increase in blood volume by itself can raise VO2 max about 10%. So, so the, uh, you know, what, what the stimulus is for the increase in blood volume, most likely it's, it's due to increases in erythropoietin or EPO yeah. that, that increases the red cell mass. And it, it's, it's been shown that by one of my colleagues here at Texas, Sophie Lalonde, that intermittent hypoxia uh, you know, breathing low oxygen gas and then high oxygen, high oxygen room air, and then low oxygen gas, and doing that repeatedly in pulsating it causes increases in erythropoietin. So maybe these repeated four second sprints is like intermittent, it's, mm -hmm. it's on off, very, you know, very, uh, very stimulating on off and EPO response to that. So we, we haven't looked at that. We're thinking about, you know, doing a study to uh, yeah, so that, so the, see if EPO is, is increased. Yeah, so the EPO, erythropoietin, is what stimulates red blood cells. So that's putting up your red blood cell count, and you've got the increase in blood volume. So you've got more oxygen carrying capacity. So that's putting up your VO to max, yeah. I mean, at least in part, yeah. So yeah. that's great. So, so doing sprints, as you said, is a, is a you know you've got to learn that it's, it's there's a lot going on. There's a lot of forces and things. Do you need to have a bit of a base before you do that? You know, or do you do you think you know you you need to do some fitness training first, or you're going to get straight into doing these sprints? Yeah, I, I don't. We haven't seen that you need to do any fitness training before the the four second sprints, and you know, we're not doing them like you would normally do a Wingate test. Which is the 30 seconds. Uh, so yeah. we're using yeah. our iner inertial load ergometer. So, you know, another reason that we've focused on four seconds is because that's how much time it takes to cycle from zero RPM standing still to about 200 RPMs uh, when you have a flywheel on the bike that has a certain moment of inertia. Yeah. So, you know, we we kind of also came upon the four second sprints because we had this inertial load ergometer, you know, back, back in 1997, we uh, published a paper with Martin as the first author showing that you can measure maximal power very accurately with, you know, with a four second sprint when you measure the acceleration of the flywheel from zero velocity up to, you know, the maximum velocity you can achieve. So, uh, so you know, we were using the inertial load ergometer more to monitor athletes training to make sure they weren't overtraining because the first sign of overtraining one of the first signs of overtraining is that maximal power is reduced, or if they're not respond if they're not responding in a positive way to a taper, reduction in training before competitions, you see they they don't improve the maximal power the way they should. We've done most of that work in swimmers, so you know we 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 had an, an we had a, an instrument which was able to measure maximal power very accurately. And, 
you know, it wasn't too far of a stretch for us to say, hey, let's see what happens when if you do training on this and do repeated, repeated four second sprints. So what, okay, so what's, what, what are you saying is the inertial load? Are you saying that, so when you start a sprint, you've got a lot of inertia to overcome. What are you saying with your inertial load bike or whatever? I wasn't quite sure that. Yeah, well, you know, we can measure power very accurately. And if we know what the inertia of the flywheel is, mm -hmm. then we can measure maximal power, uh, which will be a function. And we, 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 we measure the motion of the flywheel, the acceleration of the flywheel with some very sensitive uh, 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 devices, accelerometers essentially. And power is gonna be equal to the moment of inertia, which is the weight of the flywheel essentially, or the, you know, the angular component of that. The moment of inertia times the acceleration times velocity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we, we get, when somebody does a four second sprint, we, we get a reading of their power, you know, uh, throughout the, the four seconds. And you know, as I mentioned again, it's it's very it's very accurate. So you're saying you, you don't get that with your normal, you know, a lot of us have, you know, bikes and we do, you know, swift, you know, like we have these programs or your Peloton, uh, Peloton bikes or whatever. You're saying this is a, a type of bike, a new sort of type of bike you might think about bringing out or? Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're you know, we're bringing it out now you know, more for training purposes. And uh, you, you can't use a regular exercise bike that you find in the gym. Uh, one, because the flywheels aren't heavy enough. You know, if, if you went from zero velocity up to as fast as you can go, you know, you'll reach it in less than a second. Uh, yeah. So the flywheels aren't there. They, they don't have a free wheel. That is when you stop cycling, which is what you wanna do eventually, <laughs> the flywheel will, will keep driving your legs around and that's gonna cause injuries. Uh, you know, and you know, so those are, those are reasons that you can't do it on, yeah. on most, most stationary ergometers. Perfect, um, all right. So you're gonna get rich. So you're going to retire and um, log these bikes off and get rich. <laughs> you want to buy one? <laughs> sure. I've got my trainer here. I, I get that. I put my bike on the, the Wahoo kicker and do Swift and all that. So I don't know. I'll try out the four seconds. I'll see how I go. Now, that's great. I think we've, um, this, we've had a good chat about all that. Just while I've got you, I can't help thinking. We, we mentioned Lance Armstrong earlier. And... Um, I was thinking how when I had um, Andy Jones on, he was talking about um, how running, you know, what determines your ability to run uh, well and endurance wise is, you know, your VO2 max, your running economy and your lactate threshold, right? I know you've done work around this as well. One thing he said, which would surprise me a little bit, was he said that only runners really improve their economy or their efficiency and that cyclists don't because, you know, running, you've got all these sort of extraneous and you become more efficient and you use less oxygen, but he said cyclists, you don't really have that. And I couldn't help thinking you had that kind of classic paper years ago where you looked at Lance Armstrong over many years and you found his efficiency did improve. And I know some people are like, oh, you know, because he was on drugs or whatever, but what do you think about that? So, you know, do you think cycling efficiency does improve with, you know, years of training? Well, you know, we, we studied Armstrong for, uh, over eight years and uh, his his efficiency did improve significantly uh, well that's one subject uh, you know so it's it's a suggestion that it that it can uh, you know just like Andy Jones said that uh, efficiency only improves in running well, he bases that mostly on Paula Radcliffe, who he tested and had an excellent paper uh, measuring efficiency over 10 years. 
and uh, I think it takes that long for efficiency to change significantly. You know, in Armstrong's case, eight years, and in Paula Ratcliffe's case, in running ten years. Yeah. So, any papers that come out and say, we don't see increases in efficiency over one year of cycling or two years of cycling or three years. You know, it's just too short of a time. It, it takes much longer and probably lar much larger volumes of training to bring about improvements in efficiency. That's what I think. I don't know. So I'm waiting for, for a long-term study in, in cyclists you know, over, over uh, five to 10 years. Great. All right. Well, I've really enjoyed chatting with you. The wealth of knowledge. I, I keep, I keep, things keep pinging. I think, oh, I want to ask you about carbohydrate ingestion and your fluid, all the fluid studies you've done. And you, you mentioned how, you know, um, blood volume affects VO2 max. I've done, you, I know you've done studies on that. So it's just awesome. So thank you very much. If people wanted to get a hold of you, oh, sorry, did you want to say something else? No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, no worries. If um, people wanted to get a hold of you, are you happy if they like email you? How would they find you? Is it? Uh, yeah, they, they can email me at uh, my university email address, which is coil at austin.utexas.edu. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much, Eddie. Thanks again. Okay. Well, thank you, Glenn. See you it's later. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Bye. Bye.